I trusted that intuitive prompt. That's the point. Trust, even though it doesn't make sense to you because you don't know where it's leading you. And a lot of the times what we want is not achieved in this linear way. Hi, I'm Ebony, and I believe that stories change lives and everyone has a story worth telling. Sometimes, unfortunately, we let our self-doubt get in the way of us writing our stories and sharing our stories. So that's why I created Motivation to Write as a source of motivation and inspiration to help writers like you and me share our stories with the world. So I talk to the experts ranging from entrepreneurs to marketers to, to authors to uh, therapists to psychologists psychologists who share their knowledge and their advice to help writers like you and me step into our full potential. I am excited that you're here today because my guest is Bridget Jackson Buckley. She is the author of The Gift of Crisis and today she's going to be talking to us about how she used meditation to get through a financial crisis and into a life of purpose. She is incredibly wise and insightful and we went over an hour in our conversation. So I couldn't include all of it in today's episode. I will be posting the additional, it's about between 10 and 15 minutes of content as a separate uh, download on Wednesday. So be on the lookout for that. So let's learn a little bit more about Bridget Jackson Buckley. Bridget Jackson Buckley is an American author, blogger, memoirist, and interviewer. As a freelance writer, Bridget has written online articles for Examiner, Tiny Buddha, Recreate Your Life Story, Medium, Patheos, Thrive Global, and Gaia. She was the lead writer to launch Oprah Winfrey Network's Super Soul Sunday website, the 21-day Become What You Believe meditation, and 7 Days to Restful Sleep for Oprah and Deepak's Guide to Whole Health, in addition to various articles for Super Soul Sessions one through three with a writing focus that includes spirituality change challenge and transformation bridget's writing unexpectedly draws inward through her ability to convey complex spiritual concepts in a practical and accessible style bridget now resides in los angeles with her husband three children and miniature schnauzer and enjoys working with individuals and organizations who are interested in conscious change conscious business practices conscious leadership and empowerment. I am here with Bridget Jackson Buckley, and I'm so excited. Bridget is a writer with a capital W. You've written for some big time uh, hitters here. Uh, Medium, Thrive, Global Journal, Awareness, and Drumroll, OWN, (laughs) Oprah Winfrey Network. Um, this is great. This is great. I'm so excited. You have a book called The Gift of the Crisis, How I Used Meditation to Go from Financial Failure to a Life of Purpose. And I also read that you're a proponent of journaling, which I am also. So I'm very excited to, to talk to you about that. Um, I also want to mention that you yourself have interviewed, <laughs> again, some really big um, personal development people that this is very own, right? And all these people appear on her network. Eckhart Tolle, Iyanla Van Zandt, Deepak Chopra, uh, Elizabeth Gilbert, Elizabeth Lesser. You are just, this is wonderful. This is like a treat. I'm, I'm yes, this is a treat. I love the subject matter. So <laughs> you, know, you gotta reach out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So tell us because in the, your book synopsis, I'm just going to read this because it, it was written okay. really well. It says that you reveal how to explore crisis as a tool for courageous change, regaining your self-esteem with self-love and self-compassion. The gift of crisis will show how repeated catastrophes can serve as a catalyst to undercover the underlying purpose and how questions posed during a meditative state can reveal answers that can redirect your life. Um, so I was wondering, maybe you could just take us back to like 2008 or the financial crisis, like kind of bring us into that story, like how, what propelled you on this path? Uh, okay, well, how can I sum that up? Um, okay, so we had in the book, uh, The Gift of Crisis, uh, we had, my husband had just renovated like my childhood home and it, like it was a huge, huge project. And in 2005, we moved into the house and then like three months later, 
we got married after being together for several years. And then three months after that, he almost, he almost had a stroke. Like he was hospitalized due to the symptoms for the onset of a stroke. Wow. As you can imagine, that pretty much like changed everything. It changed everything on our way forward because at that time I was home with our second child, our daughter, McKenna. She, she was, still a toddler at that time and he was our primary source of income mm -hmm. so that I mean that that was a major a major health scare and event because it took him out of work for several months mm -hmm. so with that situation like we we had a little, little bit of savings but we went through it very quickly you know paying living expenses and food and everything so it was like such a beautiful situation took such an unanticipated, you know, an immediate turn and just, it just completely changed the trajectory of our lives because we were unprepared to deal with a long-term health issue and being out of work for, for long-term. So it was during that time that, you know, that, that was extremely stressful, mm -hmm. very stressful. And um, while I am a huge proponent uh, of therapy and I would have gone in a second could we afford it but I couldn't afford it right. so I did have at my disposal was the fact that I love to read and I could always go to the public library which oh my gosh I would do a commercial for the public library <laughs> I love the public library I have like five public library cards wow. but so I would go to the library, you know, and I would pick up our oldest child who was in elementary school. His school was right by a library, so we would stop all the time. And I would literally just walk through the spirituality and self-help aisles and just kind of look and see which books jumped out at me. Because mm. I just, you know, I obviously I felt like I needed some help. Mm. You know, I went to reading and then I had the semi-support of a spiritual community because I would have gone to this spiritual center more, but our youngest, I couldn't put our child in the childcare, like she didn't want to stay. So, it, so I was very limited in what I could do. So when I listened to New Thought spiritual leaders, you know, and read books from psychologists, uh, spiritual teachers, um, self-help books and all of that, I noticed there was one underlying message, like a commonality in all of the books, and it was about the benefit of meditation. Hmm. And so then, you know, I saw a documentary with, you know, a spiritual teacher on it, and he was talking about meditation. And I remember looking at him thinking, gosh, he looks so healthy and vibrant and right. <laughs> and like, I do have a well, call. like maybe he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> So I said, okay, I'll give it a try. So that was pretty much like, it, it was like the true beginning because I started to meditate in the traditional sense of sitting quietly for a period of time. And I started to notice with a consistent practice, really a calming of my nervous system, hmm. Feel, feeling calmer and, and more grounded and able to deal with this crisis that we were in. I mean, obviously, I didn't just sit down and start meditating, and then everything was just perfect. Right. But I stayed, I stayed with it for for a period of time. So, really quickly, and then like you know, the years passed, and we ended up losing the house, which was a devastating, devastating experience for us, as I outline in chapter one of the book. And it was about that time, like right before we lost it, that I started. Another, another idea in the books that I was reading was to ask for guidance. Mm -hmm. In my meditation session, asking for guidance and to see what would come through. So that's how that all started. So what does, I mean, you kind of gave us a glimpse. What does meditation to you? What does it look like? How's, how do you practice it? Because I think a lot of us think of meditation as, as you said, sitting in silence. Um, but we also think that it is, in addition to sitting in silence, not having any thoughts in our head, like some, somehow we're supposed to just be like be blank up here. <laughs> and, then, and then the minute we get a thought and we get distracted, we feel defeated. Like I just fell, like this is not working. So yeah. what, is, what is meditation to you? Well, I mean, that's, that's there, but 
when I first started, it was, it was a serious push and pull. I mean, I would sit down and immediately I'm going into like, can I just win like a shopping spree to Costco? I mean, like I was all over the place, you know, and, but, but I, 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 I kept with it. I kept with it. And I would, I would say to answer your question, what is meditation? Yes, you can, you can meditate in the traditional sense where you sit quietly with the intention to quiet, calm, and clear your mind. Absolutely. But I think also you can really tailor it. You need, I mean, when I sat down to meditate on our bed, like I had a very, very sincere intention to connect, to really, like I, I felt like I wanted to be inspired, like I needed some help, like I needed some guidance. And I, I was willing to sit quietly and to, you know, to, to stay with that practice. So at first it was difficult. I mean, there were, there were lots of, I mean, the thoughts were just like a runaway train, you know? So I started a little bit like maybe like 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And sometimes the entire meditation was just thoughts, you know? And then the next day I do it and it's like, oh my gosh, I noticed like I had like a period of silence for like a minute, you know? So, so what ends up happening is that those periods of silence begin to widen. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, wow, I had like, I was deep into meditation for like five minutes. And as you continue with it, 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 it expands. The silence starts to get louder, if you will. And you also notice that gosh, what is up with this pattern of these, these incessant thoughts that keep coming up? Like you start to notice the patterns in your thoughts. Mm -hmm. The continued contemplative practice that I was doing and reading, I understood that thoughts are really just thoughts. Like I'm, re I'm really condensing this. Um, and that you can also use that time to just, to just look at what is coming up from your subconscious that th those are those thoughts it's primarily what's coming up your thoughts of, of of fear and lack and that you you have so so much trust in doubt you have so much trust in financial hardship like i know that we're not going to be able to meet this like you can have that time to look at that and then as you continue with the practice you start to see that you can really just let those thoughts just drift by you don't you don't have to jump onto them and grab them and like yes i want tell me more like you can just let them go by that is so, that to me that is one of the main purposes of meditation there's so many benefits of it but just understanding that you don't have to follow the thoughts that you think mm -hmm, mm -hmm. especially self-sabotaging ones exactly that are, that are keeping you in a really stuck small egoic mind and egoic response mm -hmm. so i so in the beginning for a period of time i it was it was push and pull like i said and then as i continued i would notice that i could sit for like 30 minutes and i mean just be so deep that when i come out like like i don't even hear anything and i come out of it and it's like wow like where have i been as you train your body as you continue your body is becoming trained to follow your consciousness and medita meditation does help with an elevation or expansion, if you will, in consciousness. And so it starts to feel like exercise. Like when you don't do it, you, your body is feeling that you're missing it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I would say most importantly at the beginning to start mm -hmm. is to, un is, yeah, yeah, your, your thoughts are going to be all over the place, but is your response with anything that's difficult in the beginning to just say, oh, this is difficult, I can't, and I'm done, you know, or will you, like, in, like any other thing, practice, you know, whether it's writing, whether it is running, whether it is teaching, like, practice, meditation is a practice that you come back to repeatedly until it no longer feels like a practice, but feels like a way of life. Mm, yeah. And, you know, I think that the key, one of the key things that you said is that we don't have to believe all of these thoughts that are rambling through our mind all the time, that most mm -hmm. of these thoughts aren't even true. 
And so that when you get into that space of meditation and you really do become the observer of your thoughts and you can start to question like, is that thought, where did that thought come from? And is that thought true? And more than likely it's not. <laughs> and you can just let it go. I think we're so used to believing, as you said, like believing in like, this will be horrible, believing all the doubt. We're so used to that. And so that when we get into that meditative state, it helps us to just observe and not grab and hold on. It's, yeah, it's a practice to help you retrain your mind. Yeah. Because it's, it, it, and it's not only that is it true, but is it mine? Mm. So much, so much what's in our, our subconscious, like what the subconscious rules so much of what we do in life. It is ruling so much of what we do, our choices, what we believe, what we value, you know, how we behave. And if you don't even know that it's there, you are living an unconscious or you may have heard unawake life. Mm -hmm. You don't even know what's ruling your life. And so one part of, of meditation, in addition, in addition to all of the physiological benefits and the physical health benefits, there is this unearthing of these voices, these, the, the, you know, the, the conditioning in your, in your subconscious that was placed there when you were like five years old, when you didn't have an opportunity to choose. It was like people who loved you, who had their own beliefs and values, perhaps that may have been unexamined. Um, situations in your environment, maybe that you interpreted a certain way, that, you know, the energy of the environment it, it, that you were in and the way that it affects your energy field. Mm -hmm a lot going on and so meditation uh, it helps to bring all of that up to the surface so that you can be aware of what is going on in within the depths of you so that you can consciously choose does this serve me mm. believe in this value like is this true for me is this authentic to me is this the way I want my life to be directed it is, it is really such a good uh, tool for you to, to examine so that you are consciously making choices of what you want to create and bring into your life, as opposed to being on autopilot. Right, 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 right. Just, yeah. And I wonder, because yeah. you also mentioned that uh, you would set an intention for meditation. And um, that's something I never really even considered. I guess maybe I I don't meditate all the time, like you do, I'm sure. But I, I, I don't know that when I sit to meditate, if I set an intention, I think that's really important because sometimes, and I can just speaking for myself, it can be when those thoughts, um, you know, bubble up in my head during meditation, they can be very painful. And I just don't even want to sit there with them anymore. I just want to yeah, walk away. Yeah, from it. yeah I, get, I totally get it, you know, but it's like I was talking with a friend and she had some issues going with her air conditioning unit that's placed in her window. And she thought that there was a little bit of mold under there. So the analogy is her choice was to just continue using the air conditioner, knowing that there was a little bit of mold. Or does she want to pull the whole thing out and really look and really see what is underneath? What do I need to do to get this stuff cleared out? Or do I just want to leave that little bit there and pretend like I don't see it? That's essentially what, what is going on here. I mean, and we can see it playing out in the outer world. There is some mold present. Believe me, believe me, I understand that there are some uncomfortable aspects of ourselves, that we have experienced some uncomfortable things. I have too. I mean, like throughout this whole experience that I write about in the book, there were some, there were some not so pretty parts of me, mm -hmm. you know? And, but it, it it, it wasn't really until like I, I really, really looked at it, you know, that it's like, wow, like that is, that is such an unconscious, toxic, healthy way of responding. I don't know if you've read the book, but like I wrote about a really ugly incident in chapter four. I mean, it, it, where we had a house guest come and I was like, we were in the midst of financial hardship and I didn't want that to be known. Like it was safely protected within our family. Nobody knew how bad things were. But to have a house guest, an unexpected house guest, oh my gosh, like I made her 
so uncomfortable because I wanted her to leave. And, and of course, there were some other things that she were, was doing that I felt were just not conducive of a respectful house guest, I'll say. But that whole experience just showed how when you are, you know, when you are really not dealing with your own issues and how you can project them onto other people, mm -hmm. you can perceive it as if someone is doing something to you and you're the victim when it really is you creating your reality, you know, and you really not wanting to face what is yours. So, so much of, so much of the gift of the crisis was really looking at myself, why I was doing some of the things that I was doing and really, really, really honestly examining where this stuff was coming, not only where it was coming from, but like how I was continuing to perpetrate it and put, putting so much energy into keeping, you know, difficulties going in my life. I wonder, is that why um, a lot of people feel fatigued or exhausted because they're putting so much energy into these thoughts and creating these stories. I think it's so funny when people say, I'm not creative. And I'm thinking, I think everyone is very creative because we're always creating the stories about what other people are thinking or what's going to happen. Or Well, we are creative beings. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We're yeah. always creating. And like I said, you can be creating unconsciously. You can be creating consciously. Right. Yeah. And I, I don't think I answered that. Like you, you spoke about intention. Um, okay. Well, yes. When I first started, <laughs> uh, I had a couple meditation sessions when I was like, please give me the super lotto winning numbers. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, it was, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm being honest, but then, you know, with a spiritual practice, you know, the, the spirituality, the path of the heart, the path of awakening, mm what is the self and what is not the self. It is not so much about getting, but it's about letting go. Mm. It's about letting go with what no longer serves you. So that you can truly, let, like letting go what is not truly the self so you can be your authentic self consciously creating. That's what this is about. So as I moved through that and came to understand that even more over the years, the intention became sometimes to, it varied to sometimes to connect with my heart. Sometimes the contention, the intention was just tell me what I need to know at this moment. What is it that I need to know? Sometimes the intention was give me guidance on what is my next right action in this situation. Hmm. And sometimes it was just like, I have physically exerted myself trying to manipulate the situation, trying to control the outcome, trying to make it be what I wanted it to be. And it's just not working. So I surrender. What is the next step? Mm. So, so, so again, once I got to that point, asking those type of empowering questions, it, it, I mean, that that to me felt more of a sincere attempt in connecting with the heart that excuse me than the previous of give me the winning super lotto numbers right yeah <laughs> i think a lot of people have probably, say, please. i'm sure god has gotten a lot of prayers for uh winning lotto <laughs> numbers well because you you know this is it was just so expensive so so interesting and i mean there's a lot that i could say but it, it there is just, you know, when you're experiencing this, the type of financial situation that we experience, it's like, whatever you're dealing with, whatever you feel like is so evidently missing in your life is a call for you to express that. Mm -hmm. I felt so, what, what is the word? Like, not abundant. Right. Everything was leaving, you know, like, we don't have any money. I can't buy anything. Like, we can't go anywhere, you know, like everything is just abandoning me. Like, and mm. it was it, in that experience that I learned that abundance is not just money. It's not just winning the lotto. Like abundance comes in so many forms. It's health, mm -hmm. creativity, it's mm -hmm. love, it's, it's receiving love, it's giving compassion, you know, not being judgmental, noticing the abundance of the vegetation around me, noticing people were so generous to, to us mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so just that shift in mindset like even after a while when 
when physically we were still in the same place after we lost the house and moved into a different living situation after a couple of years i started to feel more abundant not because of something that happened on the outer but what was happening on the inner mm. on the inner as you start to feel more abundance more love you start to experience that in your external reality mm. mm -hmm. how familiar you are with these but the outer is a flat reflection of the inner yeah the feeling so unloving that is an opportunity for you to express more love in your life mm. if you're feeling like you don't have anything that's an opportunity for you to to give what you can where you can with what you have from where you are right you know because a lot of the times i thought well i, I don't even have money to donate to charity but i had time mm. You know, I could donate time. I could make connections. You understand what I'm getting at? Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I've, I've seen that. I've, I've experienced that a lot in my life. If I'm complaining about oh, I'm not getting the attention that I want or I'm not getting uh, so-and-so, they're not calling me I, like I think they should. Well, am I reaching out to them? <laughs> I should yeah. want to myself? And usually the answer is no. Yeah. So it is, it is a message that you need to be doing what you feel you're lacking, I think is what you're or, or being informs the doing. Being informs the doing. Yeah. And obviously meditation, while it's not the only practice, it worked for me, the being informs the doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it, it's, yes, of course, we live in this, you know, you know, we live in this, this, this realm of action. You know, you, you do need to do things, but there needs to be a balance between doing and being and forcing and allowing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know when you're forcing because it feels stressful, you know, it just feels like things aren't working. And you know when you're, you're allowing because when you're allowing, you're giving room for other people and other, um, you know, outcomes to come in that you perhaps didn't expect. Mm. I think sometimes when, like, if you think of allowing, you think, people think that's just being passive or lazy or useless because we've been taught that if you want something, you gotta, you gotta make a move, you gotta act on it, you gotta, you always constantly have to do, 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 do. But sometimes in all of the doing, you you lose a sense of yourself, you exhaust yeah. yourself. And so there, it comes to a point where you kind of just have to, you have no choice but to relax and allow things. But that's a hard concept to grasp. Well, and that was, I give another example of that in the book of when, when I did that and I was just literally exhausted and I was really, um, I had started to, I felt, internally like this intuitive prompt to volunteer which of course logically makes no sense because and you know if you don't have a job why are you volunteering right but that was <laughs> just another way that you know the presence was speaking to me that that is a part of trusting mm. what is within you the divine guidance that comes through us in the form of our intuition curiosity and wanting to lean in a direction, even though it does not make any sense. I kept feeling this like volunteer. And after a period of time, I started getting a little bit of work from, from volunteering, but it was, it was, <laughs> it, it, it made no sense, but I trusted that intuitive prompt. That's the point. Trust, even though it doesn't make sense to you because you don't know where it's leading you. And a lot of the times what we want is not achieved in this linear way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know? Like yeah. you're, you're, you know, you you have to trust what's coming through you, you know. And I ended up volunteering and then getting a little bit of work, and then it was like, okay, well, I want more, more, more. And I was really, 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 really pushing, pushing. Like, are there any open full time positions? Are there, you know? So I was kind of exhausting myself, like you just mentioned, and then. Finally, like when we were at this point when like we needed some money to put towards rent and I could, there was no 
opening at the spiritual center that I came home one afternoon and I was just in tears because I was like, okay, I've done everything I can do. Like, if it's time for us to move, if we're not supposed to be here, fine. And I was completely in surrender. Mm. And my body felt light and open. And I was just in total acceptance of what was right in front of me. And you know, and that, then, that reminds me of Bridget, like what you just said, we, we tend to attach to a particular outcome. Like yeah. we want this to be the outcome, we want this to happen. And that might not be for our best interest. Right. And we're just overworking and exhausting, stressing ourselves out, trying to get something that if we had it, we'd probably stress ourselves out even more, right? Right, right. Yeah, yeah. But, but what I wanted to say about that is because you said sometimes surrendering and allowing is equated with being lazy. But it, I mean, I felt so, so strongly in that surrendering. Like I was, like I said, I was in tears, which meant that there was a release going on. And so I was just like, okay, okay. I mean, everything was light. And I mean, literally like the next day, I think when I went into work, the um, office manager called me into her office and I was like, what now? And she was like, surprisingly, we have an opening. <laughs> to offer you about this and so I, I'm like what and so then I it in the book while we cannot tangibly say like the release in my energy you know was correlating with the, my experience of this opening now at the center still there's no way you can't tell me that they're not connected that it's like the divine presence the divine intervention and so it was from that that I started working like 20 hours and that eventually led to a full-time position in accounting. Oh, wow. Yeah, so, so it's, um, things can come about in unexpected ways if you just kind of relax a bit. So that you can see that I was doing and I was allowing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I can remember when I, when I grad, this is after, yeah, after I graduated from college, obviously I really needed a job and I kept getting like this, like in, intuitively, I kept hearing, you need to call your father. And at that time, we weren't really talking. We didn't really have a close relationship. And I was like, what, what does that have to do with anything? Whatever. I mean, he'll call me on my birthday, you know. <laughs> um, so it just got so strong. And so I, I called dad. And, you know, we had like a little short conversation. And the next day, I got a call to come in for an interview. Okay, you hadn't been talking and you spoke with your dad and you had like a release of some emotional energy around your relationship with your father is what you're saying. Well, no, I just had, I had the intuition to call. Mm -hmm. Even like the, I had the, I don't want to say a voice because then I sound like I'm crazy, but there was like a voice that was saying, you know, you need to call your father. Like, and I, in order for this job to open up for you, you're going to need to call your father. That's basically, that was the message. But I didn't, I didn't like, I was thinking, well, what does my father have to do with like getting a job? This is ridiculous. Like, no, but I ended up calling him. And then it was like the next day I got the phone call and I've had other instances in my life like that, where something usually is, I need to reconnect with someone. You need to call and say hi or check in. And then once I do that, like something will open up for me. It's just, it's crazy. Okay. So that is something for you. I mean, not necessarily to say like, if I hear a voice, I'm crazy because we have been trained to discount our internal guidance. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what I'm saying about retraining the mind. Like just because someone outside of you may have said, this is crazy for you to hear a voice. Who, how, like based on what? We receive internal guidance all the time. It's just, a, it's your free will of choice of what you choose to follow. And also, you know, like where, like what, what is influencing that, you know? So you have now several examples of that. There is something in this when you hear this internal guidance and you take action on that guidance. Mm -hmm. the you take action on it, the more trust you build for it. Right. Yeah. So that that is your signal. That is, that is your, you know, like your spiritual breadcrumb. Like I already know, like if I keep having a thought about something and it just won't go, like I know 
it does not need to make sense to me at this point because I've had enough experiences where that's how this book came about. Hmm. How this book came about because I kept having a thought that I should type up some some entries from my journal when I was writing in my journal throughout meditation. I kept having this thought like to type this up and of course me being primarily left brain throughout my entire life wanting a logical answer for everything I was like okay I'll type it up I'll type it up so I finished typing it up you know I felt light and you know and then I had this thought you should ask you know Bev if she knows any Asians but the egoic mind will come in and why would you call her? Why would I call my dad? What does that have to do with anything? And then you can talk yourself out of your own blessing. Right. Yeah. You know, so I did ask her, do you know? And I just knew she was going to say, no, she, she, it worked out. The book got published. (laughs) (laughs) Such a non-traditional, non-linear way. And this stuff happens to me like I said, not because I'm lucky, but because I'm really, well, I have really leaned into this trust. Mm -hmm. Know that life is for me and that we have help. It's like, are we going to respond to the way the presence speaks to us through our own internal knowing? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that everything is rosy and perfect and that you never have any problems and that you don't take action but there is, you know, I have structured my life under, you know, the knowing that there is a bigger purpose to what's happening here and that there is a higher intelligence around me and making up this planet and that I don't know everything, nor do I have to figure everything out. I can do what I know how to do from where I am, but I can also ask for guidance. Hmm. You mentioned um, journal that you journal during meditation. So you do you have how does that work? You have a a computer in front of you or a pen and paper or what does that look like? <laughs> so okay, so when I would sit down, I would normally do my meditation where I had like I would start with a prayer, you know, an affirmative prayer, um, and then I would have a period where I would sit quietly, the traditional meditation. Yeah. When I when my body felt like it wanted to ask for for guidance then I would just pose a question and so I did that several several times and I I was like at first kind of like you like what is this what am I hearing where is this coming from but then I really 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 honed in on okay how do I feel what is the pattern that's coming through in my mind is it loving is it fear-based Is it me, like, talking to myself, telling me what to do? After a period of time, I was like, okay, it's consistently loving. It's always coming in, like, on this left side, like, right here. I can't remember what's said. Okay, so let me just bring a pad, and I'll sit on the bed and cross my legs, and in the dark, I'll just scribble out what's coming through meditation. And then after it's over, the next morning, after I drop the kids at school, I will rewrite what came through. So that my process yeah yeah like over a year I did actually I still do it mm-hmm. it sounds like channeling well it does but I wouldn't really say that it was that I never felt like it was some foreign thing it all it all, it feels like it has like it's a part of my higher self floating in like some like something is opened up within me that I'm able to just access a different part of myself Mm -hmm. And now I totally trust that because I did that, like I said, for over a year and I put it away, Mm -hmm. do anything with it. And then when I was doing one of these interviews that you mentioned, I was interviewing someone who wrote a book and I asked her, how did you get all this information? And so she said, I channeled most of it. And it was like a light bulb went off and I was like, oh my God, I have like all of these notebooks from my meditations. Wow. I took them out at that time and reread them and every single thing that came through in the meditation was completely applicable to everything that I had experienced that it it was just so, so relevant, not only for me, but also like for everyone. It was like just so much universal truth in it. Mm -hmm. Like, oh my gosh, like this could be helpful to so many people like it wasn't just for me and so then after that that's when I got the 
the, the internal prompt, you should type this up. Mm. And that, that's how that happened. Bridget, do you think that every crisis is a message to us? I do. I do. I think that every crisis can deliver a gift if you can, if you can be in a state that you're willing to extract a gift and not let the crisis hijack your mind and hijack your soul. Hmm. There is something there for you. And that does not mean that you may not feel like, well, I, I don't want this situation. This is not something I want to deal with. Because, you know, stuff still comes up in my life. And I'm like, I would really rather not be dealing with this. <laughs> yeah. I've had enough experience to know that feel the feelings of what you're feeling. You could feel afraid. You could feel uncertain. You could feel very uncomfortable. Feel those feelings instead of trying to gloss over them or, or push them away. Feel them, you know, so that you can move through them. And as you move through the experience, there's an integration that takes place. And then you can say, okay, what else is there for me here? What am I not seeing? What is this situation trying to teach me? You know, and that practice helps you to develop resilience. Hmm. You know, because you could have gone through a crisis situation. So when something else comes about, you're not, you're not just overcome by fear because you've already dealt with something and you see how much grace was afforded to you and how you move through that. And so you know that whatever adversity comes, you can deal with it because you have these practices to help you center yourself, to ground yourself. You have your meditation, you have your journaling so that you can look at what the situation is bringing up for you. You know, you have your walking outside in nature that helps to soothe you, going to the beach, whatever it is, chanting, whatever it is, but these practices help you move through these difficult situations so that you can lighten yourself, you know, for a better word, to be open to receive what the situation is trying to show you or give to you. Yeah, it's, why do so many of us, or I guess we're trained because that being open to receive what the situation is teaching us, I don't know if that's something that we're taught to do when we're, no, I mean, let's be, no, you know, no, we're, we're not, and, and, and I want to be clear, like, I'm not making, I'm, I'm not talking about, like, you lose your house and then you're sitting on the couch like, okay, what's here for us? Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you might not necessarily be like that. Exactly. Yeah. You know, but, but you might be like, okay, okay, I have to accept we, we can't keep this house. Like, we're going to lose the house. I have to accept that. This is where we are. I feel very afraid, but I'm going to continue going forward, even with my legs trembling. That's the hard part is accepting. Yeah. Like learning to accept. How do you do, and that probably has to go with, uh, goes hand in hand with letting go, as you mentioned earlier, but that accepting that I'm going to lose my house, accepting that um, I'm, I'm sick, accepting, you know, it's just, it's, good Lord. Well, I, I mean, I, I was in resistance for the losing the house for, you know, for some time, like I was, we were all, I mean, so clenched, so tight, so much resistance, so much fear. Mm. Put your attention on amplifies. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. totally inevitable. Mm -hmm. No matter how, I mean, and then we were dealing with all kinds of stuff like, you know, the, the 2008 financial aid crisis, the bundling of the loans, you send in one money order, the loan is sold, the amount you owe changes. Like there was all kinds of stuff going on. So it, 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 it was just, it was just, you know, a very difficult situation. But once we accepted, okay, this is it, this is going down. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, it's okay, how are we going to find some place else to live? You know, we have our credit is ruined, what's going to happen and stuff. But we found, you know, um, a property owner who said, when I had difficult times, somebody gave me a second chance. Mm -hmm. So we were able to find some place else to to move, and it's like I don't know. It's it's just you just keep going, but not in resistance, and know that even the very situation that comes about that you thought you would simply die if it yeah happened. yeah 
like if this goes down, I'm just going to stop breathing. But I didn't. Yeah. I didn't. Yeah. You know, even when the lights were turned out and we put the last box in the truck and pulled off, we were still breathing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We thought it was like going to kill us, didn't. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it was from that, it's like, okay, now I can go into a pandemic. Okay, okay this is really interesting. This is really different. Okay. All right. So let's, let's adapt. Let's be malleable. Okay. we got to make some adjustments to our routine. Mm -hmm. I don't like it. I want to go see my, you know, you're moving through all of this. How can I use this time? I can get some rest. I can work on creative projects. I can be compassionate and gentle with myself because like the foreclosure crisis, I know this is temporary. This is not going to last. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I know that while this seems highly inconvenient and devastating for a lot of business owners, there is still something that I can take from this. There is still a gift in this moment. So once I move through all of my, uh, then I get to a place of acceptance and then I can say, Mm -hmm. I want to explore a new genre of writing. Right. Yeah. You know, so there's, there's, you know, I think I want to finish that screenplay. Oh, I want to, you know, right. Yeah. Yeah. I got to put my, all my attention on 24 hours a day of this is horrible. This is horrible. This is horrible. I'm going to put my attention on what I want to create and what I can do. And I'm going to be open to the people, circumstances and situations showing up that can help me to create what I want to consciously create. Hmm. Yeah, that You bring up a good point about just paying attention in those times of, of crisis, because yeah, there are people that are gonna show up and there are gonna be opportunities that will open, but if you're not aware, you can miss them if you're stuck on focusing on the, the pain of the, the pain. You absolutely can, yeah. Yeah, so I was talking to um, a psychologist recently and he mentioned how we can, we tend to like overestimate our reaction, our possible reaction to things. Like if we think, oh, if my dog dies, I'm going to just, I'm going to die. Oh, um, yeah. And then, you know, your dog dies and yeah, you're going to be sad, but you'll get, you'll get over it. And I think when you were um, speaking just now, it just reminded me how a lot of times when we're in situations or we can see a situation coming our way, we tend to just overestimate the pain and, and, and our being able to get through that situation. And that totally just keeps us in this state of like stress. And in reality, it's not going to be as bad as you think. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that was the, I mean, it's not to discount that some situations, well, we'll say like unexpected situations that are kind of blindsided, like your child, something happens to your child. Obviously you're not like, that's not gonna be as, but you know, something that you can see coming. Oh my gosh, if this, if this possibly happens, yes, we're just gonna die. I, I absolutely agree with that. That there is just that free event fear that basically sits in our head is oftentimes worse than what we're imagining. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, it, it, and that, that state of mind, when you're so afraid of it, it could be so debilitating and it affects your abilities to make situations that can actually be helpful to you in that situation. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you think that people, um, if you're in a situation that might not be a crisis, like you might not be losing your home, but let's say that you are at a job that you are just always unhappy at, always unhappy. Is that a sign that maybe you need to think it's like pushing you? It's a message. Maybe you need to explore something else. Well, I would say a couple things come to mind. I mean, the easy answer I think that people are sometimes reaching for is I should just quit. But wherever you there you are. Yeah. So what is it? Because are you giving over your power by saying, if they just change this practice or policy at work, then I will feel happy. Are you generally unhappy? Like, like what, you know, what, what is going on? Because really you are responsible for your happiness, not the job. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, circumstance. What do you bring to the situation? And, and, and it's also not to say that everything is your fault. I mean, we are creating our experiences, but you could, you could be in a situation where somebody is being mean to you, so to speak, and mirroring something back to you. Are you being mean to yourself? Mm. Are you seeing your internal talk exhibited to you through these unhappy external circumstances at work? Are you in this situation? Because what you believe about yourself is that this is the best you can do or get. Mm. So what, what is really underneath all that? That's what I mean when I say like, really be authentic and really, really like drill down really drill down like where, where this stuff is coming from to really examine. And another thing that you could do is in your meditation, you can meditate what is coming up for you at work. The, what is the source of the unhappiness? What am I attaching to, to this situation at work? What, you, you know, just pose, pose some questions to see what floats up in your awareness during your meditative state for you to contemplate that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Can we talk a little bit about the, um, if, if people, if you find that people are often mean to you, that's often a reflection of how you are to yourself? Yeah, I think, it, I, de I definitely think it can be like, again, we are all mirrors of each other. Like, show me your friends. Right, yeah. Who you are. Yeah. You know, like, who are the people in your life? How, how are they treating you? Like, like what, what is going on? You know, I, I, I absolutely do think that if it's a situation where you are having an interaction with someone where you are really, like, being triggered, that is for you. That has nothing to do with them. They are touching upon mm. that is unresolved, unhealed within you. One of the one of the grad students that I had to work with, oh my gosh, I felt like she was so bitchy. Mm. I did. And I was just like, every time we had to have a meeting, I was like, <sighs> like I sat down in the chair, like I arrived with tension. And then one evening, I was standing at home before we lost the house and I was washing the dishes and I was thinking about this, you know, this, this coworker. And I was like, what is it that, and what, what? And I was like, ah, I can be bitchy. Oh yeah, yeah. I can be very, very bitchy. I can, I'm, oh my gosh, like I, this is me. <laughs> and it's like, once I had that realization, it completely changed my interaction with her. Mm -hmm softened so much it did not mean that I wanted to be best friends right I even wanted to hang out but it was just like this mirror image of what I look like the mm -hmm. you know the, the external barriers the again the bitchiness yeah. like wow so again a gift mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a gift. That's a hard gift to accept. <laughs> yeah, and, so, and this is, I, you know, I talked about this, or I said, mentioned this earlier, like, you will see some not so pretty things about yourself, but, you know, reassess and reevaluate and like, ooh, I, that's not serving me. I, I, I need to let that go. I've, I've had, I've had that happen to me several times where I was just like, <laughs> why is this person so rude and short with me? And not only that person, but that person, that person. And then I, I just started, you know, reflecting and, and paying attention to my own behavior. And I'm like, oh, I see. Yeah, I do the same thing. Yeah, I mean, you can definitely see. I mean, even if you take it from just the immediate, if you look at the collective, like, it just seems like we are in an epic moment of so much dishonesty, like shown to us, like, through the media, you know, what we see political arenas and of course this is a simple a simple but and it's so bothersome so it can pose the internal question of where am I being dishonest to myself in my life mm, yes yeah dishonest too I find that yeah if, if you know what I think it's so interesting if I ask someone like what are some qualities that you just dislike in people 
those same qualities they have themselves. <laughs> exactly. And they don't and like those qualities about themselves either. <laughs> Exactly. Oh, yeah, I can I can see that real quickly about myself. But it's also the opposite, the qualities that we admire. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You cannot even recognize it if you don't have it within yourself. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Is this why um, parent child relationships are so can be so tense? Because you can see and I'm not a mother, be your mother. Mm hmm. You could see I have like sections dedicated to the children and what okay. they show me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But even just as as a daughter, I could see how um, I embody some of my parents' great qualities, and I also embody some of their not so great qualities. Yeah, I, I can sure. I'm sure growing up, they could see those both those qualities in me, and that would cause some tension. And you know. Our relationship yeah yeah I've of course I've, I've dealt with that too with my parents where I'm like oh my gosh why <laughs> yeah. and you're like wow I am very very similar mm -hmm. yeah. exhibiting the same behavior just in a different way Bridget I can't believe we're out of time yeah um, that was a great discussion. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. This was, this was very enlightening. Um, very why you're very wise, very f full of knowledge, encouraging. So I really appreciate that you are here. Can you tell us where we can find you? Well, you can go to my website, bjbuckley.com. Um, I also have writing on Medium. I haven't posted in a while. I've just been working on other projects, but that's there. I did a Gift of Crisis video summit on YouTube Ooh. that under my name where I interviewed um, five people that are in this, you know, kind of new thought genre talking about conversations similar to what we just had. Um, the Gift of Crisis has a Facebook page. And of course, there's the book, The Gift of Crisis. You can find that wherever books are sold. Read her book, ladies and gentlemen, The Gift of Crisis. <laughs> I'm Bridget Jackson Buckley. I really enjoy talking to Bridget. I could just talk to her for hours. So be on the lookout for the additional content that I will post on Wednesday. And also visit uh, zazo.com on Sunday to um, read my big takeaways from our conversation. And definitely check out Bridget's websites, her, um, her personal web website, and then her uh, YouTube video. And of course, read her book, The Gift of crisis next week i have another meditator her name is dr christine kessinger i hope i'm not saying properly because i remember not saying it properly when i interviewed her um and she is also going to be talking to us about uh the power of meditation so Look forward to seeing you on Wednesday for the bonus Bridget Jackson Buckley content and then next Saturday for my conversation with Dr. Christine Kessinger. Okay, thank you so much for joining me. Bye-bye. <laughs>